Well, hi, and thanks so much for joining me here today for what will hopefully be another interesting session. My last two uh, runs at this radio have been uh, lots of fun. I've uh, started off in one direction, ended up in another direction, and found something worthwhile. Maybe the same thing will happen again today. So, uh, but boy, I'm having lots of fun here. Hope, hope you're having fun watching me. But uh, before I get going, I'm going to deal with the output, uh, the output tube today, and maybe a little more. A couple things I wanted to just mention. Um, you know, after I finish working on the radio and videos done and all that kind of stuff, I, I often sit and think about, uh, you know, with a, a bit of a more clear mind, uh, what went on, and I, I sometimes come to basic realizations or things that I didn't really draw attention to. So, one of them is during the last video when you looked up at the oscilloscope, there was lots of time to see that the output of the IF looked normal the output of the speaker had a hum in it. So what that suggests to me is there's some hum being introduced between the output of the IF and the speaker in some way. And one of the interesting things about this radio and many radios like them is they have a coil in the speaker called a hum coil and the objective of the hum coil is to uh, counter any hum that is made it there usually from the power supply. I know this is a terrible shot of it, but there's the hum filters showing right there. It's a little coil, hum coil. My thinking is, in some cases, you can have a pretty substantial hum in the power supply that the hum coil manage to, manages to defeat, at least defeat enough that it's not annoying coming out of the speaker, such as the case with this radio. It doesn't hum. Many of these old radios, old uh, capacitors in the power supply still, like this one, they appear to not hum. But I suspect there is a hum in there that that uh, that we're hearing a little bit of, and we saw it on the scope. So that's one thing. A hum, a hum is in my future. Eventually, I'm going to deal with the power supply uh, filter capacitors. Not yet at this point. Maybe after examining the uh, audio circuits and uh, whatnot, we may encounter this hum signal before it's knocked out of there by the hum coil. So maybe we'll see some things today on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the capacitor I replaced yesterday. Let, let's get the schematic up for a little bit and we'll, we'll look at yesterday and what's happening today too. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, schematic here. This is the 636. What's that note there? Wait a minute, wait a minute, what's this note say? On some sets, the plate voltage for the IF amplifier tube is taken directly from the positive side of resistor R9 instead of as shown. This reduces the voltage drop across R9, increases the target voltage on the tuning eye. You know, the tuning eye is not uh, is not uh, glowing in this radio. It's not glowing. Uh, it's glowing red. But it's not glowing green. Hmm. Results in a more uniform green color on the fluorescent screen. So that's something interesting. Down the road, though, and we're nowhere near that yet. The tuning eye will be one of the last things I look at. So the uh, capacitor I wanted to talk about is this one right here. This is the one I replaced yesterday. It basically connects the output here via this circuitous route. There it is. The output to the top of the volume control from which a portion is passed on to this triode and on out the speaker. If this capacitor were leaking, the, the voltage across it is not very great. So There's a small voltage here. This is not one of the ones that's blocking B+. Plus. This is actually blocking a small negative voltage. Uh, but if it were leaking, some of that negative voltage could get through here. And, and by the way, it certainly looked like it. <laughs> it was quite capable of being leaky. I did not test it for leaks, but I think we can assume that it was definitely leaking. So some of the negative, negative voltage get in here and end up on the grid here causing it to be more negative than intended. You know, I'm kind of making this up, but that's what I think is going on, causing it to be more negative and quieting the operation of this triad here, which would quiet the whole output, the whole uh, whole output and the rest of the radio. So I think that's another factor here. Uh, I, think, I think I noticed I went from having the volume up really high most of the time to having the volume set pretty low. So, okay. Uh, another thing too is if the, if the capacity of this capacitor were shot, so it's more like an open circuit here, then you wouldn't get much signal making it through, and that would also quiet it. So you know that could be another aspect, the uh, 
the leaky bias problem could be a crap, a crappy idea. Could just be this thing was no longer a 0.01, it was a 0.001 or something like that. Okay, now today, today, so today I want to focus on all of this here. Um, mostly, I'm going to check out this capacitor, is probably the first one we're going to check out, along with what is going on with this all the way down here, all the way down. That looks like a connection there, doesn't it? Okay, so it's connected right to the, let's call this the negative bus. We'll call that this, this piece here. So negative from the filter capacitors. Negative side of the filter capacitors. So, so this, um, and, oh no. Right, okay, leave it at that. So the cathode is solid to the chassis. So how do you get a circuit out of this? So solid to the chassis is here, here. All these are drawn in a way it's a little hard to look at them. This point here is the same as this point. This set of resistors is kind of very similar to this set of resistors. It's just a voltage divider down to the chassis from the negative bus. And now you know what, I can't, I can't explain this any further. I really can't. I, I should, I'm not going to take the time to sort this out. I think I'm going to leave it right now. Suffice it to say, this is a technique for developing a negative bias in a radio with a positive power supply. That's, that's about the best way I can say it. That leaves the, the, these resistors, I can say a little more, these resistors will leave the chassis positive to the negative bus. That makes anything tied to the chassis positive to the negative bus. Okay, I'm going to explain this a little better. Here's the negative bus through this big resistor. And here's the chassis, positive to the negative bus. So that means, you turn that around, negative to the chassis. And that would be the bias. And we saw in the book, the bias for 6F6 should be, you know, around 15 volts or something. 15 volts negative, and my measurement here was 2. So what that implicates is, uh, not much down here actually, because this is tied directly. Implicates this capacitor, that's for sure. This capacitor can be leaky, and some of them there's a high, well, yeah, there's a fairly high B plus here, probably 200, 250 volts pushing on this capacitor. A few electrons sneak through, collect in here this big resistor. This is a big one, I'm sure. I can't read it there, but I'm sure this is a mega ohm or something like that. So most of the, so so pressure will build on this side, and if that's the case coming from here, that'll push this grid more and more positive. That's very bad for this tube. The more positive the grid, the less the bias on the grid relative to the cathode, the more current flows through it, not making any sound. It's just quiescent current. It's just idle current, you can call it that. Um, and, and if you have too heavy of an idle current here, the tube will run hotter than intended literally because of the effects of the electrons crashing into the plate in huge volumes, something like that. They generate extra heat in the tube. The tube looks hot to me, but you know how it looks, well, who knows. So let's let's go in and we'll go after, uh, let's see, we'll try, try and measure this grid potential here. The problem with doing that is my voltmeter, the best ones I have are 10 mega ohms. Well, I mean, that's not so bad. If this is a one mega ohm resistor here. Maybe hooking up 10 to ground here isn't going to make much difference. That's how I got the two volt measurement before. We'll repeat that. Then we'll go right after this capacitor next, I think. Because by then we will have found it and we'll know what it is. We'll cut it out, test it, put a new one in, and retest the voltage here and see what's happening. And step number one. Now in terms of monitoring this, 
There's a couple ways to monitor a tube like this. One is the uh, B plus voltage, but you're kind of monitoring. Uh, it's not really the best way. <coughs> the cathode current, or the current through the tube, plate current or cathode current, uh, that's really worth monitoring, but that's tough. If there was a cathode resistor here, it would be easy, but there isn't. So it's tough to do that. I could consider the resistance across here and measure a voltage drop across here and end up with some notion of how much current is going through here and therefore through the tube. I could do that. I could feel the output transformer, see if it's hot from too much current. I can take the temperature of the tube itself. Uh, that's tricky to do. I have an infrared meter here, but you know, you're shooting at glass, which is hard, first of all, and then Hard, hard to read a temperature on, and all this stuff inside here is glowing away, and I'm sure it's emitting uh, thermal radiation that my instrument would pick up, so it's it, pretty tricky to get. But what I could do is I could do a comparative test. Stick the instrument, the thermometer on here, take a reading, note it down. It's not a real reading, it's just an index. Do the thing, read it again, see if it's different. The difference can tell me something. Maybe we'll do that too. I think that's fairly easy. Uh, checking these resistors, um, there's really only one here, isn't there? There's very little current will travel down here, by the way, because this is going to be a big resistor with a very small voltage on it. So I'm thinking, I don't know what to think here. Not sure what to think. Still don't quite get this down here. Okay, let's get on with the uh, let's get on with the work. Look at this diagram all day. Let's not. Okay, man, that was an awful lot of talk for what is really a pretty straightforward straightforward thing. Now the first problem is that the output tube is way down in here, a little awkward to get at. Maybe I can rearrange this just a little bit here. Access down into this area. Now, um, let's first of all figure out which, 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 which capacitor is the grid blocker. So, a 6F6 grid is pin number five here, according to my notes. Hope I did that right. Pin number five. Uh, flashlight. Okay, I think my flashlight is. Here we are. Here we are. Oh, good. Easy to see the tube base. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I see a resistor connected there. Oh, it's this red one right here. This this red capacitor is the grid blocker. So neither of these two look original. This one up here also does not look original. Somebody's been in here poking around in the past. So these are actually pretty new looking capacitors. Now this one, this one appears to be coming from the bottom of the volume control. Bottom of the volume control. Let's just figure out what that one is for, for fun's sake. It's gotta be that one. Point, it looks like point oh one or oh two goes to ground. Let's see. Does it go to ground? What did I do last time? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, I straightened up my shop yesterday. Don't know where anything is anymore. of silence. Hey, that's unusual for me. Okay, some fun measurements here. First of all, the ground. This green one back here. 
Doesn't look like ground. So that's the red one. Slowly working its way up. <clears throat> Might be heading for the size of the uh, grid leak resistor, I can call it. Uh, overscale. Yeah, 1.6 mega ohms. Now that is probably that is on the grid. So that's on that's the grid of the output tube. Uh, after the capacitor. So that's reading the resistor to the chassis, the one I said was going to be big. It's probably a 1 mega ohm risen to 1.6 or or I don't know for sure. Hard to read the size on this. Can I? We'll look at that later. This green capacitor I thought this went to ground. It certainly doesn't. Is that So that's half a million ohms there. So that's the terminal to which it's connected. Half a million. And then I've actually touched the wire lead. There we are. There's half a million. Is there a cold joint in here? I don't think so. Not connected to ground though. Not connected to the chassis. So I got I misidentified this uh, green one. The green one is coming. Oh, here's another thing. I think I, I may not have gotten on video. Let, you, let me get the close-up camera just to show you this situation here. Come with me, camera. I think. Uh, I don't think I posted this little observation yesterday. And you may have seen it just coincidentally. Hang on one sec here while I get this set up here. Can you tell what you're looking at yet? Probably not. Wait one moment while I have to fire up my focuser here. Another three, two, one. Focus. Okay, so we're looking at the back of the volume control here. This is what I noticed when I moved this. The whole, the whole volume control is moving. Looking at it very carefully now. You know what? This does not look right. This this looks broken. Son of a gun, it is. Well, that might have happened after. Oh, you know what? I think I was lucky. I think I think this wire that was cut and I soldered has broken apart again because I didn't do a good job here. But it must have remained in contact. Wow! To see, wow! Already, I, I knew it. As soon as I started to work today, I would find something I didn't expect right off the bat. I already did, <laughs> even if it is a little bit embarrassing. Let's tack that thing back up so it's not giving any trouble. Alive. So the reason that connection would break is because of the looseness in the volume control. Let me work. Let me work the control itself and see if it puts any kind of. It does put a little bit of mechanical movement there. Hold still, Mister. Uncooperative camera this morning. Okay, I'm gonna again just kind of wiggling the. Oh yeah, see that. And that unsoldered wire appears to be soldered now. It's just it's just got a little bit of a grip on it there, so that's probably how it was yesterday. Anybody else moving funny? So these kinds of movements in a long, long run lead to failures in, in radios of all sorts, including actually more commonly in modern electronics where the components are mounted on a uh, on a board. Uh, often the volume controls and things like that are kind of soldered to the board, and that's it for their mechanical their mechanical stability. So when you 
work the control, you can transmit some movement, and in the long run, you're gonna you're gonna have a cold solder joint or something show up. Okay, soldering iron must be hot by now. My shop's getting a little messy here. But if I clean it up again, I won't I will really lose track of where everything is. Okay, I've got a camera's right where I want to put the soldering iron, so I'll come in like this. Come in like that. Probably getting the solder into the right spot there. There we go. Okay, again, this is not a very good connection. I just explained why this will fail in the longer run. So I'll, I'll probably replace that wire entirely at some point. Because I'm going to be in there doing the capacitors eventually. Just for now, I just want solid enough. That, that's going to do it. Okay, wow, okay, first surprise. <laughs> Let's carry on. More surprises coming. I'm sure of it. Apologize for the rough camera stuff here. Yeah, it looks like a Christmas tree in there. What? What is that? Green Christmas tree. It's too early for that. Look at it, look at it. So I mentioned this yesterday, this floating connection here. What was here before that it has to look like this now? Because it, this is not normal. So this, this resistor back here could easily be a replacement. Easily. Uh, the, point, the big red guy here, let's see, can you see where the lead goes? You can't really see it, but it goes down to a terminal down there. It's pretty long leads too. Um, See this, so this is going to the grid of the output tube. The signal level here is high already, so a little, a little bit of extra noise from these long leads probably wouldn't do anything. It'd be on the uh, preamp tube, the detector tube uh, triode, where you'd want to be real careful about letting anything get on the grid you don't want. You know, see, oh, this foil end here is connected to the tube. Other end. There's the other end. It's really hard to see in there. Really hard to see. Just double checking the other end. The other end goes to the same spot as the green one. Okay, let's look back on the schematic here for a second. Okay. So I'm pretty sure this is the red one, then the green one would be here. We'll go to the top of the tone control. You know what, that's where that long wire goes, top of the tone control. Perfect. Okay, so I know what we're dealing with. Red one here, green one there. Now what if this green one is leaky? Is that, what's that going to do to this set? So it's under, it's under pressure from the plate voltage here link some positive voltage down here. Oh my gosh, who knows where it might go after that. Down through here. Holy smokes, all over the place. Well, yeah. Let's do these one at a time uh, because I anticipate this might have some interesting effects. So let's go after this guy. So we'll make the measurement, do the capacitor, make the measurement, listen to the radio the whole shot, see what happens. That's the plan. Okay, first things first. Uh, make a measurement. Practice first. So we're going to go from... We should try to go across that resistor, come to think of it. It's really the same as 
it's the wrong way. Really the same as chassis. No, uh, negative bus. Yeah, not not the chassis. We want to go from the negative bus. here but actually the voltage that's of interest is from chassis to here we'll do them both if we can so that resistor uh, can I spot that resistor easily let's just go back and take a quick look figure things out a little better so that resistor should be connected on the other side of the red of the red so this is this is the other side by my definition and somewhere in here in the darkness, somewhere in here in the darkness. So, so I see a yellow capacitor right there, right, right there. That yellow thing down there looks like yellow. Let's see, body end dot, uh, yellow, purple. We can't see the dot. But it's 47, 47 something. And uh, one lead's definitely connected to that same terminal as the red capacitor here. The set's not on, hasn't been on today, so I'm going to stick my fingers in here and look it over. Wow, that's a tough resistor to get at. And you see the other lead in there. Kinda. Kinda. You can't, I can't. <laughs> Enough of that. So I think that's it. That's it. Let's look on the. Uh, Schematic here. Can I make 47 out of the number? Ooh, I can't make any other number. Let's quickly pop it up on the screen and take a look there. Maybe I can zoom in on it. Um, so we're talking about this resistor here. Well, it looks like 74,000 is what it looks like. Can you make 47 out of that? No. Uh, this, this manual I'm looking at, is this the manual? Does it have a... No, no parts list here. Okay, uh, I don't know what else can be. I mean, we're seeing it clearly here. We're seeing it connected clearly. This must be it. So what I'll do is I'll try to take a resistance measurement. The set hasn't been on yet, so I can get away with it. So I'll try to maybe just read the resistance from here to the chassis. That'll give me the resistor resistance. Okay, good idea. I don't, is it a good idea? Sure it is. Sure it is. Let's get the bigger view in here. Uh, so a resistance first. I have not concluded. Be a smart move. Down to the chassis. On this side of this capacitor. So I'm expecting this to be 470,000, 4.7 million, 47 million. Well, it's not going to be 47 million. That's pretty much an open circuit. 4.7 million sounds weird. Uh, 470k is really half a million. That's probably what it's supposed to be. And look what I'm reading here 1500. Paralyzed. Am I reading this properly? Just looking at the schematic again. Unless I'm misinterpreting where a dot is, yes. I am reading this correctly. I'm sure I'm not misinterpreting it. Okay. <laughs> you hear the hesitation in my voice as I'm looking at it there. Well, let's see. If it's supposed to be half a million and it's actually three times that, it's it would it would what, what would that do? That would reduce the amount of charge uh, bleeding off or leaking off the grid. Make it easier to charge up the grid with uh, accidental leak into it through the red red capacitor. If uh, it just make it much more sensitive to throwing the grid potential off. So now if I want to read to the negative bus, the pl best place to get it is probably up here. Right on here. Because I'm getting ready now to do the voltage measurement. I'm going to turn the set on and, uh, and from then on i got to remember it could have 
a bit of a charge on it. Voltage. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's just make sure everything's safe and secure here. By, by the way, I don't talk much about safety in my shop, and the reason is, and I do talk about it occasionally, but not in great detail, because I do not feel qualified to instruct anybody on how to maintain their safety in an environment like this, other than to say, smarten up about hot chassis and uh, everything else. But uh, hot chassis, if you don't know what I'm talking about, type hot chassis problem into the Google and start reading. This radio does not have that problem. But you could easily, if you're just getting into this, you could easily think, I'll go get a small radio, like a five tube small radio. I'll start with that because these big ones, they look scary and dangerous. And the, the small five tube radio is more dangerous than this. So if you don't know what I'm talking about and you've got a five tube radio in front of you, hot chassis problem. And believe me, the first time you read about it, you will not understand it. And the second time you will not. So you got to read it at least three times, and I'm gonna, I, I will say one more thing about that. You need to understand that when the radio is turned on, the voltage is somewhere different than when the radio is turned off. And you cannot control it because it all depends on how you plug the unpolarized plug into your outlet. So, now that's making sense, you're in danger if you've got a 5-tube radio in front of you. So, and I'll, okay, I'll say one more thing, because it was bothering me a bit, I don't say a lot about safety. What, what keeps you safe is knowledge in a, in a shop like this. Because no matter how much safety you incorporate into what you're doing, or what you have rather, it's what you're doing that is going to get you a shock. And uh, of course, every time you go to do something, you're, you're not necessarily doing something a, a standard. I, mean, I don't know how to put it. Anyway, enough of that. Enough of that. Uh, radio on. Yeah, after saying I don't like to instruct people in safety, I then start talking a bit about it. Yeah, I'm never going to tell you how to be safe in your shop. How can I possibly do that? And, and you know. Hey, I'm still alive, so I guess I've done okay here. But I have a, I have a list of shocks I've gotten. One or two jolters uh, that really wake you up. Okay, the radio's on. It's on reduced voltage. Well, that does sound like an AM radio in my shop. Or is that different because I soldered that little wire? So right now we're plugged into the signal generator. There's no signal. Oh, that's a really bad sign. <laughs> okay, we might be in trouble here already. The radio should not be ticking. Oh my gosh, really? Tell me soldering that wire did that? Again, this can be from bad uh, capacitors like this can be causing this. And also, as we proceed along in the radio, well, that's interesting, it's, it's behind the volume control. As we proceed along in the radio, uh, problems that were not apparent initially may become apparent. We sort of uncover them or allow them to surface, that kind of thing. So, you know, jump one hurdle and what comes into view? The next hurdle. So this is coming from before the, uh, before the volume control. I'm going to ignore it for now. I don't know what else to do, frankly. <laughs> Let's stay focused. Okay, first attempt now is going to be voltage on the grid as measured to the chassis with reduced supply voltage right now. Voltage on the grid. Should make a little staticky sound. Minus six. Hey, that's not bad. So voltage to the chassis, same thing as voltage to the cathode. Well, that's not bad. How come I got minus two when I did this before? I picked the wrong thing. That's a lot better. Let's let's pump up the uh, full vol. Oh, oh 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 oh. Read the plate voltage first, and we'll see what this 
grid is dealing with. Uh, plate voltage is going to be on pin number three. Pin number three. I better get this on the right polarity here. Wait a minute. Did I, ha I had these leads reversed? That negative was a positive. What? Okay, no, I didn't have them reversed. If you had plus six on your uh, on your grid, it's time to shut the radio down and fix something right away. Minus six, and then I want to look at the plate voltage on three. Plate voltage on three. Plate voltage on three. One, two, three, three. Really three. One, two, three. Yeah, that's the plate. That's not one I want to make a mistake with. There's my red lead here. So I'm going to connect the meter first to the plate. And once I have my hand on there and fairly solid, I will then put this on ground. The thing is, as soon as this touches the plate, plate voltage is on the end of this. On the end of this. Normally you'd want to ground your instrument and then go after the test. For some stupid reason I decided to do it otherwise. Because I have to move around too much to hold the other one. Or I have to put a clip lead on the ground. I don't want to bother. I'm too lazy. We're going in. We're going in with a fat test lead here. Going in again. Can't go in that way. Move the wire. Double check, double check, double check, double check. One, two, three. You know what? There's a wire. There's a wire coming off of that going right here. It's a much easier place. I think this is the plate voltage right here. Isn't that scary? It's sticking right here. Okay, we're on the plate. I think. Oops. The over 24 volt alarm going, 134 volts. So we've got minus six for 134. Now we'll give a full plate voltage. Hands off. I hear a bit of a, I heard a hum come up in the speaker. Let's do it the proper way now. I know what I'm doing. It's easy to get at. So now we're looking at just under 300 volts of plate voltage and what's happened to the grid potential. It's perfectly fine. I suppose that according to my manual it was around 1, I think it was minus 16 for 250 volts on the plate, I can't remember. I don't think there's a problem here. there's a problem there. Contrary to my initial. A little disappointing. I'll still change out those, those capacitors. Okay, what about the other one now? So we can kind of assume there isn't a leak through this one. Of course, it's the wrong radio. Get the right radio here. Through this one. And But what about this one? Coming into the tone control. So the tone control is, is, it, is, it, is there a ground on it somehow? Wow, it's all through this stuff. Ooh. So there's no, there's no solid DC ground here. Uh, make it easy to look for leak, leak, leaky leak. Well, we'll go to the chassis. This I think is carrying a bias voltage all through this stuff and up onto the two grids or something like that. I don't really know what's going on. I haven't analyzed it enough to know yet. I'll probably get there eventually. Uh, well, let's take a look. We'll look at the... We know the voltage on the top here is uh, 275. What is it on the top of this? Which is actually one end of the tone control, which is pretty easy to get at. Okay one end of the tone control. Which end? Well, we'll test both. 
and take a guess from there. Okay, onto the chassis here somewhere. Coming down. Tone control. Which one's the tone control again? So what I'm looking for is some big positive voltage. The theory being some voltage is leaking through this green capacitor and charging all this up. Doesn't seem to be the case though. Does not seem to be the case at all. So these two replacement capacitors are probably still in really good shape. We're not finding any kind of problem here that might explain things like distortion and whatnot coming out of the speaker. Unless these simple tests I'm doing actually aren't really telling the story. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll replace those two capacitors and then repeat these tests. I have an interesting opportunity here because uh, because I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you directly. I may not know who you are, but I know you're there. Even though we're separated by space and time, when I turn on the cameras here, I feel the presence of those of you who are viewing the video, who will be viewing the video down the road. So I don't feel alone here, even though I am. Okay, should we test these two capacitors before we turn the set on? A little change of pace. Why not do that? Just take a second. We have all the time in the world here. Five. Where's my leads? Here they are. First one is the green one, that's the one related to the tone control. Okay, so we're watching the eye here. You have a good good view of the uh, opening of the eye down here. So when I uh, hit it with 25 volts DC, the eye will respond by closing quickly and then opening again. It's how much it opens that matters. My guess is that this is a uh, perfectly fine capacitor. Let's see, here we go. That opened pretty good. 150 volts. Still opening. 250. Well, didn't quite open on 250. It's rated for 400. A new capacitor tested like this, uh, this would pop open completely. So there's a bit of a leak in there. That's the tone control one. Oh, somebody at the door. Is somebody at the door? Yes, who's there? Hello, you coming in? He's probably coming in because it's a nice, nice looking day outside. Hey, up here, peanut. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, okay. Okay, let me give him a little attention here. Show your face to the camera. There you are. You just kind of bored out there, are you? It's a change of seasons here, of course, and this cat knows what's happening. He knows winter's coming and the outside fun is disappearing. He's a little depressed. He's a little bit depressed these days. Like I mentioned quite a few videos ago, a flea disaster happening in my house. Uh, that ended overnight with the proper uh, uh, medicine. Insecticide. Okay, peanut, that's it. We gotta go back to work here. Overnight. Okay, so slightly leaky. Now, this is the grid one. This one's a 
little more important, in fact. Hey, let's put the focus there. No, I didn't measure the value of the other one. Oop, let's go back. Let's go back. Try to measure the value of this. It's not leaking much, so the, I should be able to measure it. Okay, let's do that. Supposed to be 0 0.008, so that would be uh, on this scale, where I've got it now. 0 0.008. Let's see, 0.5. I always have to clear my head on this before we do it. 0.5. 0 0.001. So 0 0.001 is the center one. And 0 0.005. So 0 0.008 is almost where the pointer is. Now, you probably can't see what's happening. It's so subtle. So the eye is actually moving a little bit. And if I pick the spot where it's most moved, it's right around the 0 0.01 mark. So it could be that there's still enough of a leak in here to throw this test off. Because th this eye will open uh, on a, uh, to indicate a capacitor's actual capacitance. Now before we charge this one up, we'll do the same with this. This is supposed to be a 0.01, it should be open right there. So there it is, there it's opening. So now it's opening, uh, you know, 0 0.015 or something like that. 0.012 actually. So it's really close to 0.01, just as it's supposed to be. So if this, if my theory is true, that a, a reading like this, doing the capacitance test, actually subtly indicates there's no leak in this capacitor, we will find out. We'll find out. Okay, ready for the leak test? 25 volts to start off with. Just closing, closing my door there. Here we go. Open up quick. 150. Quick. 250. Opened up almost all the way. So it's showing less leak than the other one. So, and now, just to convince everybody, including me, I'm going to grab a brand new capacitor. This is a brand new 0.01. Stick it in here. These capacitors are rated for 600 volts. It'd probably take a thousand. And new like this. 25, watching the eye. Point. 150, 250, 350, 450 volts. You see how fast it opens? That's what a non leaky capacitor looks like. Now this is going to wait just a bit. Again, on this instrument, when it's sitting idle like this, it has a short across the capacitor, so it's trying to drain it out. 400 volts give you a pretty good, pretty good poke. Okay, I'm sure it's good though. There we are. So now the question is, did this really make any difference in the operation of the radio? Okay, so my theory would be no, or my guess would be no, because because. Uh, Oh, you know what? I still have my uh, son of a gun. I still have my SDR antenna hooked up here. And uh, hopefully I did this right, and the influence of this SDR connection is minimal, especially with the kind of thing we're doing right now in the audio circuits. What does it matter? But I kind of forgot I was connected there. Okay, first check and make sure these solder joints have taken properly. Big excess piece of wire in there. I gotta cut away because that's for sure it's gonna eventually cause something bad to happen. There we go. Throw my tools around. I think we're ready. I think we're already volume down. Good show. Here we go. Oh, plug in. And using the dim lights. Now again, made a change. Watch the lights. The lights work properly. Turn the radio up a little bit. I can put it on full. Hello, radio. 
Oh, it's it's alive. It's got no antenna whatsoever. Let me put an antenna on it. It could be me. Wait a minute. Turn it up a bit. What was that? It's clicky. Oh, no, it is. <laughs> oh, so funny. I get my finger like this. I'm letting my hand touch the chassis, which it should never do. But I'm becoming the short circuit on the antenna when I do that. Some funny sounds coming out of this thing. Oh, 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 anybody hear that? There was a hum, a click and the hum disappeared. Let's just leave this for a sec. Another little click. Okay. Well, you know, it can again. It could just be capacitors that really aren't in good shape that are breaking down. So now we're on full voltage. We saw what was it minus 19 last time on the grid. Minus 19. Is what we saw this time on the grid. Positive lead to the grid. Jeez, I see 36 volts in there for a sec. What's going on here? Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> That's what's going on. 36 volts is roughly double 18. Wow, it's almost right on the money, isn't it? I like that. Now, the other one, this is the tone control. You see, you see the same voltage there. Stick an antenna on it. I'm going to put on the the loop antenna right away because it's convenient and easy. I like convenient and easy. So with one lead connected this becomes like a lousy wire antenna. I thought I heard a voice there. Connect the ground. That's the difference between a wire antenna and a loop antenna. Volume check just by turning it down. Okay, we're not even not even 20% on the volume control to get this. Tone control. Turn up the volume. With vascular claudication, it doesn't matter if you're bending forward or not, or you're on a cycle or not. You're going to still have so most of the tone activity is in the last few percent of the turn. That could be, uh, I put in a bigger capacitor and that may have caused that effect. So the uh, sort of the linearity of the control may be out. And they're never very good anyway. But it's working fine. So I think that's all working fine. Uh, now, should we, what time did I start late today? Should we go for another one? Another one would be, in the audio area, it would simply be this capacitor that's across the... Uh, primary winding.
I, 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 I think it's this one down here. I shouldn't stick my finger in there because it's connected right to the cable that goes to the speaker and yeah, probably to the field coil. And, uh, well, not the field coil. No, no, not the field coil. I'm going to the primary coil. Well, it still is out on the speaker. It's, it's in here. That's cold. That's cold. That's good. Um, so really, this one's not connected to ground or anything. It's just it's a it's a cross. It's actually, often it's connected to two tube pins. That's the way they do it. And that one is connected, yeah, pretty well essentially to two tube pins. Let's get rid of it. Uh, oh oh, um, that one may affect the um, uh, the uh, you know we need to look at what's going on with the harmonic stuff in here. Hang on a sec. There we go. Okay, so what your the audio analysis software is simply listening to the microphones, which again, why you see my voice on it. And uh, I'll just be quiet at the key time. So this is a lot of problems with doing this test. Uh, we're going to look at, at uh, uh, how much um, harmonics there are uh, coming from the signal. I'm going to feed the radio in a moment and some of those harmonics could be coming in various ways nothing to do with the radio so let's not get too hung up on this but let's see what happened because last time there was clearly harmonics in of significance and you could hear them in the sound of the radio too. So okay I'm going to tune the signal generator to where the radio is tuned. Just give me a sec here. So if you look at the frequency display, it's the lower chart, you see a distinct line of 1,000. That's what we're hearing. You see it 2,000 and 3,000 also. The 2,000 one is uh, 30, 18 decibels below, 18 dB below the main tone. That's, that's pretty low. Uh, might, might not look so low on the chart, but I believe that's really quite low in terms of hearing it. This sounds th th this sounds pretty clean to me. Uh, let me tune the radio a little bit here and see if we can muck it up a little bit. The uh, vertical lines are broken on my com my uh, screen as I look at it right now, uh, like in the video. So you may not be seeing a continuous vertical line, but in fact, that's what really shows on my computer: continuous vertical line at a thousand. There, the break is a uh, some kind of framing effect or something like that. Uh, let's go down to 400 because I think at 400 we saw more. Okay, so there's 400 hertz. So now we see a peak at 4, 8, 12, probably 16. About 10 decibels of difference between the main 400 hertz peak and the uh, 1 at 12 kilohertz. 1.2 kilohertz. It does sound not quite as pure as I'd like it to. Can't be that bad though. Hey, what if we uh, what if we do this? I, I, I was, was going to say, why don't I put this whole thing through a different radio and see what kind of harmonics, but I ain't got time for that. No time for that. Situation is, radio sounding pretty good. Uh, 
don't think we made much improvements in fact here at this point but I got one more capacitor to do one more to do right I almost forgot okay let's do it okay so here's what I got out of there arrow box 0 0.005 Not in good shape. Okay, let's take a look and see what happens. Let me throw this guy over here. I'm gonna kind of wing this. Let me put this here. I wing it camera-wise. Okay, we're gonna hook him up right away. There, we're going to start with leak test, leak test 25 volts. That tells the story. That's one heck of a leaky capacitor. It's, I, mean, I can't, I can't, I can't uh, uh, you know, uh, it's in the zone of leakiness that I cannot actually what can I say, it's reached the limit of leak measurement there, uh, it, uh, it can be more leaky and still look the same on that instrument, so it's, it's bad, it's very, very bad. Now, I, luckily, I can replace that capacitor here, on, uh, right in here, rather than up in there. There's a point zero zero five. Wow, I'm not sure. Hey, there we are. Perfect. I get to use one of these, one of these guys here. Yep, 0 0.005. Don't do that. Talk on it. Jeez. Oh man, uh, clearly that's a heart attack maker there. Gonna end up causing an accident because I'm gonna jump one of these times. I got that a little too tight there. There, that's better. I'm gonna jump and uh, Halloween went by, we once again had absolutely no kids stop at our house. And the reason is, the front door is not on the front of the house. The front door is on the side of our house, hidden from view. We don't even use it. It's kind of goofy how this house is arranged. So the parents, if they're young kids, you know, the parents look at the house and they go, oh, crap, I don't even know where to go. Let's not go there. So, uh... But, as I told my wife, we can tell everybody that, uh, oh, Halloween went really well, lots of candies got eaten. We just won't tell them who was eating the candies here. Okay, one more. Many, many candies got eaten. the stories about uh, razor blades and apples and stuff like that. From my reading of this, it's quite a few years ago when I did, there's actually not a single documented case of somebody finding razor blades in an apple. That's what I read. That it's just an urban myth. I'm certainly not concerned about that myself. I mean, you'd have to think somebody's going to do that to hurt little kids, and they're going to do it in a way that they are completely and utterly identifiable as who did it. 
I mean, it won't be any secret where the apple came from. It's just a stupid notion that people would do that. Do you remember? Do you remember back when there was a discussion in North America, certainly in Canada, about canceling uh, Halloween because it had become too dangerous? N none of it true. This is a big terminal here. My soldering iron's having a hard time. Whoa! Let's push the radio over. That would have been extra exciting. Here we go. I'm getting some meltation now. I think that's probably good enough. Okay, so this capacitor is the one that's across the primary winding of the output transformer, even though the transformer is up on the speaker. This is the leads that go to it. That's interesting. That capacitor marks the two particular leads that go to the primary side of the output capacitor. That's a nice, that's an interesting little rule. A capacitor like this, I find in almost all radios, exactly why it's there. I think I said before, I don't, I don't fully know. I can take guesses, but I don't really know. Too much, too much guessing and imagination in this world these days, so I won't share mine on that. I'm just putting away a few tools here. And we are going to, uh, we already tested the leaky, leaky, leaky capacitor. We will now test the radio. Okay, let's try again. Um, power on. Restricted. Lights are good. Power on full blast. Volume down. Watched an interesting documentary on the Kursk, which was a nuclear sub that sunk, a Russian nuclear sub. Um, very interesting. Very interesting watching how their society handled something like that. Now why aren't we hearing the tone? Ooh. Didn't that sound worse? Let's tune this thing. Shouldn't have affected the tuning at all. action happens in just a few degrees on this control. So we'll put it up full. Wow, that looks worse to me, doesn't it? Maybe not. That's the 400. Let's try the 1000. Isn't it 20 dB difference in the last time? Let me look at it now. Just over 20, 20 decibel difference. So I don't think that had a big impact. Um, but just the sound of it, let's just listen. Now I know you're hearing this through microphones and umpteen different copies, conversions, and computer processing but you get pretty good sound on on these videos so I see the harmonics traveling together as I advance the volume as if wherever the harmonics are created they are consistent through the audio changing the volume doesn't doesn't change the I haven't turned up quite loud now to really test it, so I'm going to knock down my shop volume here. Okay, let's give it the big test. Uh, that hurt my ears, <laughs> which it was intended to do. So I would describe the sound as com coming from here as hard. I, it's just the way I would describe it. It's very hard to describe sound, isn't it? It sounds like it's like a hard sound in my ears, especially when I turned it up. Not quite as smooth and musical or smooth tone as I would expect. But I don't know. I don't know. It's just my ears. It's just my ears.
all in all, what do we get here? We got some reassurance that the capacitors down in here uh, are not leaking now. There's no more paper capacitors involved in that part of the radio. From here, we're moving forward, further up. Uh, we're going to start running into some capacitors down in here. A big one and this one here. Maybe we should go after these ones next. I'll take a look at the schematic and decide. We'll just try to work our way back from the speaker. Capacitor by capacitor, all the way back, all the way, all the way back up here. Oh, oh, oh. It's too high, man. Yeah, I'm silly. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for watching, and uh, onward.